Karsus' Avatar, an evocation, enchantment, and alteration spell. Evocation because Karsus needed to turn the weave into pure, raw magic that he was going to absorb. Enchantment for he was going to control one of the most powerful entities in the multiverse. And alteration for he was going to turn into a god. This spell accomplished what everyone thought was impossible, and his casting signified the end of an age, though not necessarily the way Karsus expected it. Let's talk about the only 12 level spell in the entirety of Dungeons and Dragons. Karsus was a child prodigy, bound for greatness the moment he was born. They say he casted his first cantrip when he was two years old, and by the age of 22 he became the youngest archwizard in the kingdom, which was no easy feat. To become an archwizard, one needed to have its own enclave, its own floating city, which meant that you as a mage needed to be able to cast at least 10th level spells. You needed to cast Proctive Move Mountain, which would form the foundation of the floating city and create your own mythal art, which would function as the battery for that city. When Karsus created his enclave, becoming the youngest archwizard in history, he wasn't particularly liked by his contemporaries who grew jealous and spiteful of his success. It is said that he also had issues producing businesses and residences in his enclave due to his youthfulness. People simply didn't trust a 22-year-old to keep the city floating. The lore actually states that to combat this, Karsus hired some of the best architects in the land to create buildings that defied the very laws of gravity and physics. The structures eventually became known as some of the greatest arcanist colleges and universities in Netheril. The uniqueness of the structures and the hope of having such a building for themselves actually lured people to his enclave and the city became successful. Being the archwizard of its own city meant that Karsus could decree laws at will. He was, for all intents and purposes, the overlord of his enclave. As it was the case for many enclaves at the time, crimes and punishments revolved around magic. This created laws very different from what you would be accustomed to. Much like with nobility, punishments differed greatly depending on whether the offending or offended party was an arcanist. Arcanists were seen as far more important to society than non-spellcasters. For example, killing the familiar of an arcanist was a very serious offense. An arcanist convicted of such a crime would typically be imprisoned in an amulet and given to the offended arcanist to do with as he wished. Someone who murdered a non-human was simply levied a fine. On average, you would be fined about 750 gold pieces for killing a dwarf, 500 gold pieces for an elf, 1000 gold pieces for a gnome, and only 200 gold pieces for killing a halfling. The killing of all other non-human races was actually considered purification and was actually not confined to this law at all. You could just do it if you so wanted to. Now, if you killed a human spellcaster, on the other hand, you would either be killed outright in a public forum or be given to the colleagues of the murdered arcanist in order to become a subject for their magical testing. If you killed an arch wizard, you were bound for the cruelest of all the punishments, where you would be tortured and subsequently healed, then tortured again and healed, and again and again until your body could withstand no more, at which point you would be thrown into a vortex leading straight into the plane of fire. Most serious non-murder crimes, however, were punished via essence sucking on dead. See, for a spellcaster, it is very likely that by far the most important thing that you possess is your skill and intellect, your, your ability to be able to manipulate the weave in order to cast spells. Certain undead had the ability to suck your very essence out of you, essentially making you dumber and less adept. These undead really were sucking levels out of these mages, something that no mage ever wanted to go through, which proved a great deterrent for crime. Now, this society actually worked well for the Netherese Empire and for Karsus and his floating city. That is, until the arrival of the Ferim. These monstrous, slug-looking beasts sucked all life and magic out of the areas that they would visit, and they were proving to be a great threat to the Empire. See, when your entire civilization relies on magic, to stay afloat. When every single one of your leaders, your arch wizards, rely on magic, fighting something that sucks on magic, that feeds on magic, is your greatest weakness. This is where we start to see the decline and the beginning of the end for the Empire. 
In spite of the disadvantage that the Netherese had to contend with when dealing with the Ferrum, they were actually doing quite well in this war. I mean, it is quite frankly hard to defeat a civilization filled with powerful arcane spellcasters who can move their cities at will. They could have sustained this war for hundreds of years if it wasn't for one small detail. Have you ever seen an art mage younger than 100 years old? It's very rare. When you reach this level of power and intellect, it becomes trivial to find ways to extend your life using magic. And most archwizards, of course, did. Suddenly, the Empire found itself with every leader, with every important person in any important office, being at least hundreds of years old. Problem was, it became evident that the magic-absorbing abilities of the Ferrum were disrupting the life-extending spells on the Arch Wizards, and many of them had their real ages start to catch up to them at alarming speeds. This caused a lot of Arcanists to simply leave the Empire far away from the war, which started to cause panic amongst the citizens. The height of this issue came to a peak when Iolaum himself left. Iolaum was considered the father of Netheril because he was the inventor of the Mithlar and the creator of the first floating city. It was thanks to the Mithlars that creating magic items was cheap and simple. It was thanks to the Mithlars that we could have floating cities in the first place. He was considered to be the wisest wizard in the Empire, and people actually looked up to him as a leader and as a symbol of the Netherese. But when Iolaum realized that his life-extending magic was failing him, he turned himself into a lich in order to stay alive and abandoned the Empire. He disappeared and never came back. This was the main catalyst that turned what was otherwise fear and uncertainty into actual civil unrest and riots. The populace of the Empire saw that the war wasn't ending and that many leaders were simply leaving. These unrests were particularly strong in Karsus' floating city, where people now saw Karsus for an answer to these issues. Karsus was the strongest and most powerful wizard in the entire empire. More powerful than Iolaum, but he lacked his discipline. Karsus wasn't very studious, he wasn't patient, many actually saw him as quite childish, and his tantrums were legendary and well-known. The civil unrest was getting to him, and with Iolaum gone, he started to feel the pressure of everyone to solve the Ferrum Crisis. At this point in time, Karsus must have been around 350 years old when he started to work on his solution, the great spell that this video is about. So what do we know about Karsus' avatar? We know that Karsus spent over a decade researching this spell, and based on what we know about the amount of money that it takes to invent a new spell, the amount of gold that this must have cost him goes beyond what can be calculated. We're talking probably somewhere along the realms of tens of millions of gold pieces. The research papers for this spell were specifically grabbed by the gods and sent on an eternal journey to the ends of the universe, so that no one could ever find them. Because of this, we have no information on the required material components for the spell, or the incantations required to produce it. What we do know comes from those that either watched him cast a spell or helped them with the gathering of the components. Thanks to this, we have the only bit of the information that we possess about the spell, and it gives us insight into just how complicated the material components were. We know that to enchant a component for the spell, just one of the components, Karsus needed to use the stone-filled gizzard of a gold dragon and part of the epidermis of the pituitary gland of the Tarrasque. We know that Karsus also needed to find a 12-headed hydra and extract its bile for the ritual process. It is safe to assume that there is much, much more, and with the same level of difficulty as what we just described, but we will never really know what was needed. Quote, this spell allowed the caster to become a god of his choosing, replacing a current god with himself the moment the spell was completed. Whether the gods received a saving throw, were aware of the casting, or other factors were unknown." End quote. Karsus's plan was simple. He would switch places with a god of his choosing, and in a single stroke of power, he would destroy the Ferrum. 
out of all of the gods, he chose Mistral, the goddess of magic, who he figured was the most powerful god in existence and who would give him the easiest time in destroying an entire race. This was Karsus's greatest mistake, for Mistral was the only wrong choice. Mistral, being the goddess of magic, was in charge of maintaining and healing the weave, the invisible strands of magic that permeate the world and allows for wizards to be able to cast spells. This is a process that she does subconsciously, all the time. Especially so around Netheril, which was constantly warping and hurting the Weave with their constant use of high-level magic. When Karsus casted his spell, he chose Mistral, and in the process, he changed forever the way magic would function. Quote, his body swelled with a sudden influx of godly power, and his mind filled with unimaginable knowledge. Karsus instantly realized the horrible mistake that he had made. He stole the power from the one god he shouldn't have. When Mistral lost her ability to keep the weave of essential magic, magic in its purest, unschooled, and unfielded form intact, the inundation of magic surged and fluctuated, and the effects of all things magical doubled for a time. A short time. Mistral sacrificed herself to save the weave before the damage became irreparable. This broke Karsus's link to her magic and obstructed the weave, causing all magic to briefly cease functioning. Without the infusion of magic, the floating cities of Netheril fell, and Karsus was instantly slain. His bloated body petrified and toppled from the high plateau above his floating city and plummeted to earth. As his body fell, his stony eyes still shimmering with the last glint of godly omniscience caught a glimpse of the cities of Netheril smashing to the ground, killing all their inhabitants. His heart broke. Greed for the power of the deities themselves caused the destruction of his home, his family, his friends, and his people." End quote. For the minuscule amount of time that Karsus was a god, he was given a portfolio to rule over as it is customary for all who become gods. His was the folly of excessive arrogance and ambition, and the folio of endless hubris. A new goddess of magic was reincarnated almost immediately, this one called Mistra, who managed to quickly restore the weave back to normal, most of which had to be recreated from scratch. Having to remake much of the weave allowed Mistra to set a new set of rules for spellcasters going forward, strong limitations that would prevent a calamity such as this one from ever happening again. Magic would be far harder to cast, making it so that intense study and practice would be needed even for the simplest of spells. She designed it so that a wizard could only hold the essence of so many spells in their minds, forcing casters to prepare their spells when they needed them. Lastly, she forbade any mortal from being able to access level 10 spells or higher. By the time she completed fixing the weave, she was able to save only three of the Nethril's floating cities. The rest were utterly destroyed. The survivors of these cities, after being planted down on the earth by the goddess, quickly left the kingdom and moved north and south to settle elsewhere. It is said that every cleric of Mistral was given dreams for weeks by Mistra, the goddess showing these clerics the story of what transpired in Netheril, both as a help in understanding what had transpired and as a warning to never attempt such a thing again. From then on, the events that transpired that fateful day will go on to be called Karsus's Foley, a story known by every race and civilization on Faerun nowadays. This is the story that most people will tell you, but it doesn't end there. This was not the complete end for Karsus. Now he resides as a vestige. Quote, Existence defines reality. Beyond it, therefore, not exists. Not even a void. This simple reasoning would be irrefutable were it not for the existence of vestiges, called forth from nowhere, composes of nothing, they exist entirely outside the rules of reality. They are untouchable, untraceable, and beyond all powers that might attempt to confine or define them. This philosophical conundrum has intrigued sages interested in pact magic for centuries and defied all of their theories. Vestiges simply cannot exist. And yet, it seems that they do. End quote. 
Carsus was not accepted as a petitioner by any god, for he didn't believe in any. Even further than that, he defied the gods and challenged them. Carsus thought that the gods were simply mortals who had achieved supreme power through magic, something he sought for himself. For an inexplicable reason, upon his death, he never made it to the Fugue Plane. Instead, he now exists as a vestige as something that cannot be explained. He now resides as a power beyond reason, beyond existence, something that exists but also does not. If you open the player's handbook and you go over to the Warlock's Pact page, you will actually find what he truly has become, a great old one. There's no way to describe it, it's just an entity that exists but also does not. An entity that craves experiencing reality and does so through warlocks. You as a warlock can actually make a pact with what's left of Karsus, and if you do, the vestige would appear to you as the form of a great red boulder. What he probably ended up looking like after swelling up with magic and petrifying himself, as the bodies of his compatriots fell from the floating cities and exploded in blood and gore all around him. A big, bloody red rock. When Carsus speaks in this form, the blood fountains upward, its height varying based on the volume of his voice. The binding mark of making a contract with Carsus is blood. You will bleed more than normal from wounds, whereas even a small scratch would release a sanguine rivulet of blood. You may also casually bleed without a wound. The powers that Karsus offers as a pact are great. Your spells would become harder to resist. You would be able to sense magic at will and as easily as others can detect smells. You would be able to dispel magical effects with a mere touch, and you would be allowed to use magical items meant only for wizards as a warlock. Thank you so much for watching. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Rukato Fan, Daniel Luna, Dr. Cowbell, Skitsia Boy, Major Fail Gaming, Saliog, Barry Maskant, 5e Magic Shop, Doc Feeder, Daniel Umar, Morgan Johnson, Zach Bowell, Simon Holman, Rusty Rain, Biotechnofrag, Kosh Bane, and Midi Ogre at best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Guys, thank you so much for watching this very interesting uh, trilogy of videos, 10th, 11th, and 12th level spells. I, I, I know that I still haven't finished the, the Hag series, I still have to do the Anis Hags, which I'm actually pretty interested in doing. Uh, I just got this sudden hype to talk about this, this kind of spells, and in fact, I think there is still one more video to talk about, which is how to actually cast these spells. Something that I mentioned on the, I believe it was on the 10th level spell video, I mentioned that there's actually a workaround that you can do in order to achieve levels above 9th level. So I think the next video is gonna be about that, so look forward to it. Anyways guys, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.